let's get started. So last week, uh, well, the first week we went over MOSFET circuits in DC. Then the second week, we primarily spent it developing this uh, small signal model or mid frequency model. And this lecture, we're basically going to continue talking about this uh, mid frequency. And I'm going to just go over some uh, stuff that uh, I didn't cover in the past and that I should have covered. So this is kind of closing out this small circuit slash DC. Next lecture, we're gonna talk about high frequency analysis of, uh, and low frequency analysis of amplifier circuits. Okay, so last lecture, we said that uh, we were gonna basically model each of our, each of our amplifiers had an equivalent circuit model and it was of the form up here. So basically you have an input resistance looking into the terminal. And then uh, the voltage that you input is amplified by little AVI. And the output turns out to be uh, <clears throat> basically amplified by that. But then there's this output resistance, which actually lowers your gain or uh, so when you're looking at your actual gain, once you insert a load, you have to actually consider the fact that there's an output resistance associated with your amplifier. So at this point, I have a question. So ideally, why would you want this input resistance to be? Small, large. So I guess you you would want right that this uh, input source right doesn't draw any current because uh, that means that there's less energy being kind of extracted from that source. And additionally, you would also like to this V sig to be equal to V i even if our sig is really large. So how would you do that? How could you make V sig close to VI? Like, what would you have to do to R and oh, go ahead. Many of you too. Wait, you want the input resistance to be a lot smaller than R sig. The opposite of that, but yeah. <laughs> so if this resistance is really large, go ahead. Oh, you had a oh. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So if this resistance is very large, exactly, since R RIS is in series with R sig, then uh, if this RIS is much bigger than R sig, then VI will approximately be equal to V sig. And so you, what you want when you design these amplifiers is to have your input resistance to be very high. 
Okay, so these things are called amplifiers. What would you want AVI to be? Just uh, if you could have it your way, what would you make AVI? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, greater than one, but in, in principle, ideally, this thing is infinity or as large as you can make it basically. So in the idea world, you would want to make this amplification infinite because then you're getting, you're putting very little in and you're getting a lot out. So you want AVI to be as big as possible. And then additionally, what would you want RO to be so that, uh, I guess before I tell you anything else, does anyone know what you would want RO to be large, small? Yeah, so you want RO to be small because here you have the opposite thing. You want all of the voltage to drop through your load. And so you want this RO to be extremely small. Ideally, it behaves like a short so that then AVI equals AV and uh, all of the voltage automatically drops across RL. So actually next class uh, or next week, we're actually going to look at what we call the ideal amplifier. And we just basically define what the ideal amplif op operation amplifier has, which is that RO will be equal to infinity, AVI will be equal to infinity, and uh, RO will be equal to zero. Uh, but that's in next week, so let's not worry about that now. But in general, when you're designing these amplifiers, those are the kind of three things that you're keeping in mind. So when we uh, looked at these circuits, I derived AVI. And for a typical common source, the gain is of the order of negative 10 RIS, meaning that, uh, wait, RIS. Yeah, uh, yeah, of 10 times the input resist, negative 10 times the input resistance. So if you have a very high input resistance, then you're going to get a huge gain. And so these things tend, oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, God. Um, some, yeah. Sorry. The, Gain is about 10 in the order of negative 10. RIS is in the order of uh, 100K. Sorry, it's too early in the morning. Yeah, I was like, 10 RIS, that sounds huge. Okay, go ahead. So when we talk about the negative API, does that mean it just like flips? Yeah, it just flips the polarity. Okay. But but in magnet, we just care that it's big in magnitude. The negative doesn't really affect anything. Uh, yeah. So for this part of topology, we're generally going to have AVI be roughly 10. RIS is going to be also big, 100K. But then R out is in the order of 1K. So basically, if we put a load that's like 50 or 100, we're not going to get very high gain because the most of the voltage will drop across the R output. So this kind of limits the lower resistance that we could put through the common source amplifier. And uh, in case you're wondering how uh, I derived these, well, in general, when people design these things, they put very high resistances for R1 and R2 uh, because it's just uh, all that's all the R1 and R2 really doing is setting up your VG bias point. And so you actually don't want to draw a lot of current from your voltage source. So you keep the amount of power consumption low. So you're just kind of choose those very high. And... Uh, but that that results in and typically basically they are the range of values that people choose for these resistors are about 100k so that's what how you get this 100k for the capital ro you're always going to have that this little ro is in the order of mega ohms and so rd is going to dominate and typically rd is in the order of 1k so that's how these things were derived and then by the same thing if you if you have gm is going to be roughly 1 over 100 and RD is roughly a thousand, so then you get a gain that's in the order of ten. Okay, so this particular amplifier has really high gain, but it also has a really high RO, so it's not ideal. Uh, the common drain, in contrast, has a very high input resistance, very low R, R out, uh, but the gain is always guaranteed to be less than one, and so you don't get a lot of gain. So it's not that useful as a amplification. And then, then finally, you have the common gate, which has high R out and uh, low input resistance. And the gain is always less than 10. 
it should be in the order of 10, not less than 10. Uh, yeah, so this should be order of 10, not less than 10. The thing is that this common gate drain, you would think, oh, this, this amplifier is not good because it has a low gain. But what people will typically do is they basically will take a common source and then on the output end, they'll connect it to a, uh, so basically they'll take the output of a common source or some other amplifier and then they'll connect that to a common drain. And what that buys you is you lose a little bit of the gain, but because the input resistance here is so high, you're gonna have a, a very, you're gonna maintain most of the gain from the original amplifier as you go to the next stage. But additionally, now you've effectively lowered your output resistance by a factor of 10. And so that's how we're gonna actually use these common drain amplifiers when we start looking at the operational amplifier circuit. So in case you're a little bit confused or are worried that now you're gonna have to analyze two amplifiers cascaded, don't worry, you're only responsible for learning how to analyze one at a time. So I'm just trying to give you a better idea of why we're going over this, how these things are used in practice, and at least give you an intuition of how you should uh, think of these parameters when you're actually designing an amplifier and what they actually mean. And uh, show you kind of, so if you're trying to design for a large IS, this kind of tells you what you need for R1 and R2. And so kind of give you an idea of how you go about designing these circuits now that you have these equations. Now there's other design decisions, which are cost, high resistance, likely means that you're gonna have bigger components. You want things to fit in a small package. And so sometimes you're just gonna say, I'm gonna go with the lower resistance because it fits in the package. So these are all the kinds of decisions that you're gonna have to make in the real world. Here, you're just trying to analyze them and figure out what the currents are on these circuits, but that's kind of how most of the engineering would go. All right. So yeah, so last week we went over this small signal analysis. Uh, we derived these linear models for NMOS transistors for the small signal, and we derived the heuristic, which was basically for solve for the DC bias, plug in GM and uh, plug in ID to find GM and RO. Once you found GM and RO, you basically derived an equivalent circuit for the uh, transistor at higher frequencies or at the mid frequency model, small signal model. And uh, in particular, one thing that I wanted to bring into your attention is that when we derived these equations, we came up with these conditions. One is that uh, VGS has to be much less than uh, two times VGS uh, minus V threshold. Uh, we typically assume much smaller really means 10 times smaller. So that's just the engineering factor that people decided that much smaller means 10 times smaller. That's just the, so uh, if you see a condition like this anywhere, then you know, okay, they're just trying to say, use the small signal model. Or they ask you to verify whether this satisfies the small signal model condition, this is the condition you would use. So I'm just going over random things that were in the other professor's lectures, since that's what we're supposed to cover. And I've been following the book. So that basically you've seen everything that you need to see. So that's why this first few slides are a little scattered. Okay, so this one actually I, I did do in, on purpose. This is not in the other lectures, but a lot of students have been asking me about the PMOS transistor small signal model. And uh, in particular, how do you actually, so since we've only gone over the NMOS, how does it look? And the answer is that the PMOS and the NMOS transistor small signal model is identical. So nothing changes. So here I'll just, I'm just gonna go through the derivation. So again, we're gonna do a Taylor expansion uh, about the point capital GS, uh, VGS and capital VDS or your bias point. And so that's how we're gonna derive our linear approximation. And so to do that, we need to take derivatives of our ID sat, well, our ID in saturation region. And uh, so first we need to take a derivative with respect to this capital X, which in this case, capital S just means VGS minus plus little VGS. 
I just did this to make the formula look a little cleaner and capital Y would be cap th these two put together in there. Uh, so when I take the derivative with capital X, well, this is just a quadratic. So I just get a two that comes out. So the, the capital X of F of X, Y, and, and notice that we already went over this derivation for P for N mus, but I'm just going over it again. It's just KP over two times two uh, X minus the threshold. Uh, and then times, yeah. So that's uh, that's the derivative of uh, with respect to X. And then when I do the derivative with respect to Y, F of X comma Y, D, D, Y, that's just gonna be equal to, well, in this case, as a function of Y, this is a linear. So it's just gonna be a nice constant. So this term is constant with respect to Y because it's just one times this constant thing with respect to Y. And so we're only going to be left with lambda y. So basically it's just kp over two capital X minus V threshold squared lambda. And so now all we got to do is do our Taylor expansion, which uh, basically says that uh, id plus little id will be equal to, well, the function evaluated at v g s uh, comma v d s plus the derivative of the function evaluated at v g s oh god here you go okay comma b d s oh wait did i Okay, yeah. So we got to do the Taylor expansion. So it's basically, actually, I might be able to just go through this in here. Okay. Okay. So, and then this would be VGS plus little VGS minus VGS. So here I'm just doing the X minus X naught of the Taylor expansion. And then I have the derivative with respect to y of f of v g s v d s. So this is a 2D. So I have to include the second linear term v d s plus little v d s minus v d s. So this is just a Taylor expansion, but now I just plug in my expression for. Uh, df dx and my expression for df dy here. And I'm gonna call this little id and this is gonna be big id because this is just id evaluated at the bias point. So that's kind of uh, what this derivation does. So here's the Taylor expansion written up in a clean form. And then I'm just calling this capital ID because this is basically, this is just the current ID evaluated at capital VGS and uh, V capital VDS, which is just your bias point. And then now uh, in this particular case, though, since we are defining ID as pointing from the drain to source, and for the PMOS transistor, ID points in the opposite direction. On the left-hand side, we're going to have negative ID. And uh, on the right-hand side, we just have our Taylor expansion which is basically how the ID and the opposite polarity vary. So that's why we have negative on here because it's a PMOS. So the sign change, the, the direction changes, but we're trying to maintain the same circuit model. So we have to change the polarity of little ID. So now we plug in the F of X and we plug in the DF dy, and then we get basically this expression here. But now if we analyze these little terms, this transconductance, because VG, capital VGS and V threshold are negative, that difference is negative. That means that this quantity here is negative. And again, uh, lambda is negative. So that means that this quantity here is negative. And so what we can actually do is replace these parentheses with absolute values and factor out the uh, negatives. And then the negatives will cancel on both sides of the equation. And the end result is that we can use the same model for the PMOS and their NMOS. So for those of you have, that have been asking me, 
that's the derivation. And that's why we decided to put these absolute values at the end of the NMOS, uh, even though they were kind of uh, superfluous. Because now you can use the same equation, same model for the PMOS that you use for the NMOS. So questions? No questions? Okay, we're almost running out of uh, things that I didn't go over that I should have gone over. Okay, so there's actually this mu f that I keep putting in the slides and I haven't really uh, said what mu f means. What mu f is, is basically if you look at your small signal model as an amplifier, what would be the intrinsic gain? So effectively you're trying to figure out what this AVI is of the uh, transistor. So you could also define what RIS is of the transistor if you consider that the input is VGS and the output is VDS. Uh, well, since the input is v, uh, VDS, VGS, there's no resistor between here and here. So the input resistance is effectively infinite. Uh, and the output resistance, uh, well, yeah, you would have to derive it, but it's basically RO, little RO. Wait, is it little RO? Yeah, you would have to derive it. I'm not going to go over it because that, that wasn't on the slides. So, okay. So at this point, if you wanna find the gain or the ratio of VGS to VDS, you simply have to do a KCL and you get that GM VGS has to flow through this terminal because uh, whatever current's coming in here has to come out through here. And so you get that the voltage from here to here is just gonna be negative GM uh, VGS RO that's equal to V out. And then you just divide by VGS and then you get that V out over VGS. It's actually equal to negative GM RO. So that's that's what we call mu F. And by what it actually signifies is the, the kind of open gain of the, uh, or the intrinsic gain of the transistor small signal model. So that's kind of the best gain we can get out of the transistor. It's GM, RO, and that's why this is significant. Now, RO is typically very large. And when we assume that lambda is uh, zero, RO will be infinite. So that would mean that you could get an arbitrarily high gain, but in reality, of course, it's finite. And GM, you actually design when you choose your bias point. So when you're choosing these bias point, that uh, the amount of amplification you get depends on how large that GM is, but then you also kind of have to make sure that you can stay within the uh, saturated linear region. So you, you have some design uh, constraints, but you could also increase GM by increasing K. And so you could also kind of increase the width of the device and the physical dimensions. But then when you increase the physical dimensions, again, you want these things to fit in a small device so there, that's not necessarily also desirable. So there's all these things you have to think about and uh, have fun, basically. All right. Uh, so I think this this uh, HDMI cable is a little, yeah, broken. But so I have to move it around to get it to. Anyway, but here's the the answer for. So this is what mu f is. Uh, yeah, so that's basically it. Okay, last thing is channel length modulation. So initially I showed you these red plots where VGS was, uh, where as you increase the, where you can basically, uh, as you increase VDS and you fix VGS, so remember this blue and red line are for a fixed VGS, you would basically first enter the tryout, tryout region and then eventually, once you got past that triode region, we said that you'd reach saturation and then the curve would be flat. But as it turns out, it's not quite flat because we have been ignoring this channel length modulation. So as you increase VDS, the current uh, actually does increase by an amount this times lambda. That's also the derivative that we derived in the previous slide. And so uh, when you look at this plot, this slope here actually tells you what uh, what lambda times ID equals to. So that slope is exactly equal to lambda times ID. So that's something that you uh, need to uh, consider. 
So when RO is infinite, this thing is flat. When RO is finite, this thing is uh, not flat. And the slope is the, the slope is not RO. It's actually the slope is actually one over RO, because it's just lambda times uh, ID. So that's something to keep in mind. And uh, yeah, so that's uh, okay. So last uh, thing that I have to go over before we can actually do some practice problems. So last week I introduced these things and uh, these amplifiers and there's some kind of a uh, terminology here. This is why it's popular because everything's just random, uh, random things that I need, didn't say. So we introduced these capacitors, but why, why do we introduce these capacitors? Well, the reason we introduce the capacitors is because we wanna introduce this uh, small signal model without affecting the DC performance. And we know that the DC wants, uh, the DC signals interact with the, the capacitors behave as opens at DC. And so we can actually use these capacitors to introduce circuit elements without affecting the performance of the circuit at DC. So we can basically design a circuit at DC. We have what we want at DC. But now we need to connect other things, but we don't want to affect that uh, the performance of the circuit at DC. So we're like, okay, whatever we connect, we're going to put a capacitor in between there. And that what the, the function of that capacitor is effectively to make sure that the circuit's performance is not affected uh, at DC. So that's why when you derive the DC model of this, it actually looked like this. So now you can actually uh, do your design at steps first you design your little four resistor network you get the the you get the bias point that you want and now you just basically wherever you want to connect something you stick capacitor and what you want to connect if you need this thing to be in ground uh you need this terminal to be a ground okay you stick a capacitor between the source and ground and now when you derive your ac model that will be in ground and if you need to include a, a ac signal will you stick it with a capacitor in between so now it only affects the AC performance of the circuit. So in particular, the there's kind of a terminology associated with this. When you use a capacitor to connect something, you call that a coupling capacitor. And when you do use a capacitor to bypass an element in the DC circuit, you call that a bypass capacitor. So that's something that you need to know that that so this would be called a bypass capacitor because the its sole function is so that in AC you don't see this RSS. That's the sole function of this uh, capacitor here. Whereas this is a coupling capacitor because its sole function is that in AC the load is in there, but in DC it's not in there. And this is also a coupling capacitor because its sole function is that in DC the AC source is not in there, but the in AC it is. So is that clear to everyone? Yeah. Can you explain AC? It's a bypass. Oh, bypass. So if I were to derive this most signal model for DC, this is the equivalent circuit. Because you uh, basically open all capacitors. Is that clear? Okay, so in that case, you would have to consider this RSS between the source and the uh, bottom voltage. Whereas now if we actually look at, uh, so basically there's three things that happen here. You have to consider the RSS, but this uh, RL is actually not connected to the DC circuit and this RS is not connected to the this DC circuit. Is that, okay. So, However, once we go to the small signal model, this becomes a short, this becomes a short, and this becomes a short. So this capacitor here effectively shorts out this circuit because all the current's gonna go through here because it behaves like a short at the mid frequency. And so this capacitor here allows you to bypass RSS to in the AC model. So that's why it's called a bypass capacitor. So we use the one we want the short one. Yeah, 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 yeah. In the AC case, yeah. And this simplifies your analysis because now your your source will be actually grounded 
directly. And, you, and if you had to consider that RSS, it would actually complicate the analysis quite a bit. Now, these, in contrast, are now connected, whereas before they weren't connected. So that's why now this is called, these are called cap coupling capacitors. Cool. Any other? Oh. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so speaking of that, <clears throat> so the common in a, in a transistor amplifier means what's connected to ground or common or what's the common terminal in the AC model. And so common gate just means that the gate is grounded. Common source means that the source is grounded. Common drain means that the drain is grounded. Now there are some caveats here, which is that uh, the fact that the drain, the gate, the source, and the drain terminal are grounded forces what your input and output ought to be. So it's not as simple as just which one is grounded. Some inputs, once you ground the gate, you cannot connect, you cannot use the drain as an input. You have to use the source as the input. And so a common gate is actually a uh, the gate is grounded and the input is a source, the output is a drain. A common source is the source is grounded, but then the input has to be the gate. The output has to be the drain. And then again, for the common drain, if the drain is grounded, the input has to be the gate and the output has to be the source. You can go home and try to do it backwards and you'll see that the circuits don't make any sense and you can't really get voltages out of them unless you make these other choices. So last year, a lot of students uh, had some trouble with this. Uh, yeah. So just make sure that uh, it's not as simple as knowing, oh, the gate is grounded, therefore it's a common gate. You have to also understand that the input has to be the source and the output has to be the drain. All right, so that's kind of the last thing. So uh, yeah, in, in Professor Capano's slides, he also went over the circuit. Here I did the derivation. I'm not gonna go over it, but now you have it. All right, so I'm just gonna spend the last 20 minutes of class going over or letting you all go over problems. So first question, what kind of amplifier is this? So we took a circuit, let, this is kind of how the problem statement. So you solve for the DC equivalent, you determine GM, and you also determine that RO equals infinity. Uh, additionally, you shorted all capacitors. And once you shorted all the capacitors, this is the circuit you were left with and you remove the DC sources. Uh, so now the question is kind of, what kind of amplifier is this? Yeah, so it's a common gate because the gate is grounded and the input is the source and the output is the drain. So I couldn't have it the other way. If I had the input here, if I had the input at the drain, actually, you could already see why that doesn't quite make sense, but okay. Uh, cool. Okay, so which terminal is grounded? Okay. Okay, so can you draw this small signal model for this? So I guess I'll give you a minute to do it and then I'll kind of go over it. Well, okay.
So does anyone know what two terminals I should connect RL to? Uh, yeah, the drain and the, so yeah, so the RL is connected to the drain and then it's connected to ground. So it's just gonna go like this, capital RL. So now we're done with this one. So what terminal is uh, the input connected to what two terminals? Yeah, so the source and the gate plus minus, and this is VI. So is this clear to everyone? Yeah. The, so we assume that RO is infinite, but in reality, you would go here, RO. Well, current source, yeah. Because remember the little equation for little id was actually equal to gm vgs plus capital ID lambda uh, d, ds. And so this is actually a capacity, this is a parallel little risk RO to a gm vgs voltage control current source. Um, you in the model because well, uh, so we assumed RO is infinite, so it's just an open circuit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, also, when we're analyzing open gates, we're always going to assume RO equals infinite. But what you had a question? Uh, when it's a common gate, yes. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. 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 It's always going to. For this class, that's not always the case. It's just that it complicates your analysis and it turns out that it doesn't really change much what the output is. Go ahead. For the other two, like the common uh, source and the common drain, is this RO actually a value of the boson connection? Yeah, so our RO is always dependent on lambda. So whatever your bias point current is, you times that by lambda, and one over that is your RO. But if you have no lambda. And if lambda equals, uh, if lambda equals, Wait, it's lambda equals zero, then it's going to be infinite, which means there's no RO. Okay, cool. So everyone was able to get the circuit. So now what's the gain of the circuit? I guess here, I'll ask a simpler question. How much current is flowing through this resistor RL? Okay, so what's the voltage from zero to here? Well, the current is moving, so it's a voltage. It's going this way, so it's a voltage drop, so. So if, if GMVGS is flowing through the RL, right? What would be V out? Yeah. Yeah. So since the current is pointing up, then you're going from zero to negative GM VGS RL. That's kind of what V out has to be. And uh, what is your input? So just be careful because remember, this is the source and this is the gate. So your input is, huh? Minus VGS or VSG. Is this clear to all of you? No, maybe questions at this point? Go ahead. So is that just like when you say negative or VGS, we're just looking at from like the top of the source to the gate. Right? Yeah. Well, from the gate to the so the voltage from here to here is negative GM VGS, yeah. and that's actually VO. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, <coughs> questions though. Yeah. Oh. Well, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is an AC. This is a small signal source. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, the current flows this way because this is the arrow, right? It has to come in this way. And so this is at a higher, the ground, the G is at a higher voltage than the drain because the current is flowing up. So there's a voltage drop across the resistor, meaning negative GM, VGS. So more questions? So if you're not understanding this at all, I highly recommend that you go to office hours, like highly. Uh, this is a fairly like example that doesn't have a lot of algebra, a lot of confusing kind of things. And uh, yeah, that it's kind of like bare minimum. So that's why I put it up also, because that way you know whether you need extra help or not. Okay, so does anyone know the gain at this point, I guess? Yeah, it's just GMRL. So basically, the in, v, this is a V in. So then you get that the output is just GM, RL, V in. And then you can just divide by V in to get that AVI is. It's a, or AV is actually GMRL. Cool. So uh, I've actually added these two practice ones, and the answers are at the end of these slides. Uh, you can try to do these at home and then maybe tr get some more practice. So these are also very simple versions of the common source and very common drain. And the assumption is, again, the same, that you've already done all this. Uh, you've done all the DC part and tier your AC equivalent models. Oh, oh, so the input is connected to S and G. So this is actually plus minus VGS. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So automatically, you just know it's just the negative VGS. Go ahead. What was the sorry? Yeah, so it's it's more of that I'm drawing the same circuit model, but I'm just drawing it. Uh, I'm just changing the order. So the the source is always connected between the drain and the source. It's just that in that particular case, since this is the ground, I wrote the gate at the bottom. But so because I drove, I put the source up here, that meant that the current source would have to point, but it's the exact same model. And if you draw it using this exact thing, if you're not comfortable, so you're gonna get the same answer. It's just that uh, when you draw it like this, the circuit actually looks cleaner. So that's why, uh, but really the source always points from the drain to the source. It's just that I changed where I placed the source and where I placed the drain when I drew it. Go ahead. Sure. Okay, so let's just go over this. So this is zero volts, right? And I'm telling you that the current I going through here is equal to GM VGS. So if this is zero volts, what is the voltage here at this terminal? Okay, so negative G M V G S R L. Okay, so what is the voltage between here and here? Yeah, exactly. So you have V out equals negative G M V G S uh, V G S R L. And then uh, we got plus minus VS. Oh, sorry, VGS. So you understand why this is VGS, because this is the gate and this is the source. 
So then Vn is, yeah, it's negative Vgs, right? So then I say this is equal to negative Gm, negative Vn, Rl. So the negatives cancel, and then you get that the gain is Rl times Gn. Is that good? Go ahead. No, 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 no. At this point, so the, the sorry, it, it affects the DC part, but once you go to the AC part, you've inject, you put in the ID into deriving GM and RO, and you completely forget about the transistor. At this point, you're just dealing with that pi model, so you don't really worry about. You you don't worry even whether it's P mode. Basically, it's this like you just need to find out that capital ID in DC using what you learn to analyze DC circuits. Uh, at this point, all transistors look the same, all of them. Okay, go ahead. Other questions? Well, in this case, it's AV because there's an RL because we we put RL into the circuit. When we assume that this thing is open, uh, when we, sorry, when we don't include RL. In this particular circuit, you can't really compute AVI because it's such a simple circuit uh, that we've completely removed. It's a very idealized form of a amplifier. So it just doesn't, that's why I didn't have you compute an AVI because it's just not, but the, uh, for small signal analysis and testing your basic understanding of it, I think these are good circuits because it's, it's you only have to do one loop. And uh, of course, you need to know your 2K1 stuff, but at, this kind of isolates the 2K2 stuff, which is actually just doing the AC analysis. OK, so let's just go through. Ha, ah, we're not going to go over it. So I actually went over this uh, circuit last semester. So if you look at my uh, week three lecture, uh, you can basically get an explanation of how to solve this circuit. I guess just very quickly, does anyone just off the top of their head know what region of operation the circuit is in? Yes, it's in saturation. So first, how much current flows in this direction? Yeah, zero current flows because there's no current flowing this way. There's no current flowing this way. So that means that no current can flow this way. Uh, and so that means that this voltage is equal to this voltage. And at the same time, since these two voltages are equal, we went through this thing where we said that VD equals VG. And so that means that VDS equals VGS. And that means that VDS equals, since this is a NMOS transistor, VDS is uh, greater than VGS minus V threshold. Because this NMOS means that V threshold is greater than zero or it's positive. And so that means that it's in saturation. Uh, yeah, so I, I the derivation is here for every, basically every step, but we don't have time to go over it. So I recommend that you go over this. And so, yeah, so that's basically all I have. Next class, we're going to look at high frequency.